सेट कर लीजिए So it is very awkward to say, but before we begin, may I make a request that all of you may switch off your mobile phones. It's a convenient modern technology, but very inconvenient in an auditorium like this. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a matter of pleasure for us to welcome you to this function organized to hear Professor M.S. Swaminathan deliver a public lecture on food security in an era of climate change. This function will also see the release of a book uh, written by him. Uh, before we begin with all these formalities, may I please request uh, the faculty to welcome the guests with bookies. Please do that. And I'll request Vice Chancellor Professor Gopinath Pradhan to felicitate Professor Swaminathan with the traditional shawl. Also, Professor P.C. Keshavan. Vice Chancellor is again requested to please lead the guests to the traditional lighting of the lamp. Thank you, sir. This function has been organized by Chair for Sustainable Development, which was set up in IGNU in March 2007. The objective of this chair 
was to promote education for sustainable development in India. And it is a remarkable achievement on the part of this chair that sustainable science as a discipline, perhaps for the first time in India, has been instituted under this chair in IGNU. Professor M. S. Swaminathan uh, does not need any introduction, is the honorable chairperson of this chair for sustainable development in India. The chair is in the short span of five years time, the chair has succeeded in developing six programs and it is my duty to inform you about these programs because they are quite novel in their development. There is a postgraduate diploma in sustainability science and I, as I said sustainability science is a completely new area on which work has started in IGNU. There is an appreciation program. IGNU is a unique university in offering appreciation programs. I do not know if many other universities in the country have the facility of offering appreciation programs which are non-credit programs and aimed at the general public uh, who should be able to understand the key areas of science. There is a program on leadership which focuses on nutrition science. There, is, there are two other appreciation programs on sustainable management of Ganga. One is on sustainable management of Ganga and the other is on sustainable management of wetlands in the country. And there is another appreciation program on biodiversity, uh, which was offered in July 2012. Two major programs are in the pipeline, one of which is slated for a release in the month of July 2013 when the new session, academic session begins. This is going to be a postgraduate certificate in climate change and sustainable development. And climate change is going to be the focus of Professor Swaminathan's public lecture today. And there is another program, which is a postgraduate level program, MSc in Sustainability Science. Five years time of this chair and so much of work is quite commendable. Before I invite Professor Gopinath Pradhan to deliver the welcome address as Vice Chancellor of this university, I would request the uh, invited guests' attention, would invite their attention to this beautiful floral decoration which is also the result of a faculty member who is from the uh, School of uh, Agriculture and is related with the discipline of sustainability science. I invite Professor Gopinath Pradhan, the Vice Chancellor, to welcome the guests and begin the program formally. Honorable members in the dais, members of the IGNU family, and other guests present in the hall, welcome to this function where we have the privilege of listening to Professor Swaminathan. The university, with its mandate of reaching the unreached, has moved to address the basic social issues from its inception and now we are moving towards the themes, the courses, the skill that are required to make our presence felt in almost every field that is related to the social concerns. Today we are having the privilege of addressing to some of the basic issues which are yet to be resolved satisfactorily. Once we come into the arena of sustainable development, our basic concerns are still to find a solution to what is known as the commons problem or tragedy of commons where the property rights are not defined, hence we tend to exploit, over-exploit the resources leading to its unsustainable use. Within this arena of themes, we are going to 
address a basic question related to food security. So these themes are definitely exciting and we have with us the two distinguished experts when they are working with IGNU have produced some results which is emanating from the School of Social Science. As the Vice Chancellor, I welcome both of you, sir, to IGNU. To the faculty members, to other guests, again I welcome to this function to listen to the distinguished experts in the field. Sir, our basic concerns still remain. We must try to find a solution to the food security to have a basic human dignity with us to have enough food stock to sustain ourselves as human beings with a heads high off in the air, which is a basic dignity that we are trying to achieve. The food security bill provides some glimpses of the policy concerns that are being addressed and how we are trying to provide answer to food security problem. Now, combining with the sustainability question, obviously the food security is drawing everybody's attention and the basic question we are trying to solve is to make food a, sustainab a, a sustainable uh, available availability with the mass of this country. I hope the insights drawn in the book will provide some insight to this. With this, I again welcome the guests and we are going to have some glimpses of the type of solution they, they, they are emerging from the analysis. I welcome all of you again to this function. Thank you, everybody. Professor Swaminathan's distinguished lecture will be preceded by the release of a book written by him in association with Professor P.C. Kesavan. The title of the book is Evergreen Revolution in Agriculture. And I will request Vice Chancellor to kindly release that book. I invite Professor P.C. Kesavan, who is a distinguished fellow at Swaminathan Research Foundation, to please introduce the book. Good afternoon. Professor Pradhan, Vice Chancellor Ignu, Professor Swaminathan, Professor Toka, Professor Saluja, Professor Ramanujan, many faculty members, students, staff, uh, Mirnal Goyal, who is the publisher of the book, uh, press and uh, electronic and uh, press media personnel, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a great pleasure to introduce the book that, has, that reflects hundreds of series of lectures and books written by Professor Swaminathan. I want to clarify here that my name being the first name in the scientific domain means a student. As a student, student has always the privilege of being the first author, but the senior author is usually the person who has conceived the whole thing and put it into it. Very briefly speaking, you all know how Green Revolution was ushered in, again, by the efforts 
and dedic dedicated uh, 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 endeavors of Professor Swaminathan in 1960s. In 1960s, I was a student myself here. I was also the general secretary of the Students' Union and mess manager. I know that for as many as three to four days a week, we would never have, we would not have either chapatis or rice. That was the condition. And we lived in those days as what they say from ship to mouth. More than that, Paddock Brothers had written a book, Famine 1975, America's decision who would, su who would survive. They had used a trade principle and they said that Pakistan, East Pakistan and West Pakistan and other countries, people of those countries could be saved. But these Indians multiplying like maggots should be written off. So it was adding insult to injury. It is in this background as well as the background that when India attained independence, as you know, there was the backdrop of the great famine of Bengal. So Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru was very deeply conscious of it. And he said, everything else can wait, but not agriculture. Well, it is really very easily said, but then how do you do it? You couldn't increase the productivity. All what you could do was to bring more land under irrigation, under irrigation and also carve out the forest land to agricultural land. These were all sort of window dressing, not really addressing the deep problem of having to increase the productivity per plant per unit area. In that sense, it was, uh, many people got involved in it, among them Professor M. S. Swaminathan. He had the idea that if you can change the archetype of the plant, a short cull, strong cull, but the panicle length, ear bearing uh, panicle, whether it is rice or wheat, if the same length is maintained, then when you apply uh, chemical fertilizers, much of the chemical energy with the help of the photosynthetic, uh, the photosynthesis that is using the solar energy, the plants could be able to elaborate more grains and that wouldn't also lodge about the time of harvesting or when under heavy irrigation conditions and that would be the solution. Well, the, to cut short, we have described in our chapters what all at, it had to go through in order to get and how fortunately there was a nor in 10 dwarfing genes available from Japan to United States and from United States to Professor Swaminathan who made use of them in evolving or producing what you call these short semi-dwarf and dwarf plants which made fantastic yields. I think in the year 1968, for the first time, Punjab farmers har harvested 17 million tons of wheat as against the best ever previous yield, uh, record of about uh, 12 million tons. The world country was in jubilation. The government of India was preparing itself to commemorate, at uh, least a new stamp, what called wheat revolution stamp, to commemorate the wheat revolution. With all these things going on, there was one person, the architect of the Green Revolution itself, Professor Swaminathan, was not all that jubilant. That is my assessment, don't ask him. Uh, he was more concerned about the long-term effects of this uh, new agriculture. By the way, he did not call it a Green Revolution. Green Revolution was a term coined by William Gadd of the US, uh, International, US Chief for International Development. And he chose the term Green Revolution to symbolize two different things. One is green against the red revolution of the Soviet Union. And the other greenness is for the chlorophyll, which is the pigment, chloroplast is the pigment, then the green leaves, which, are, which absorbs the green, uh, the solar energy, and the thylakoid membrane, those converts electron transport and things like that elaborates the protein, uh, this uh, starch synthesis. In other words, we are all gas, or, uh, gas of the green plants directly or indirectly. So to cut short, what was his idea? He said that this is a, an exploitative agriculture. As against what William Gadd said, he said it is exploitative agriculture. Because you have to put so much of chemical fertilizers into it, and you have to put a lot of water. That means uh, with kind of perverse subsidy, the farmers would drop the uh, groundwater and indiscriminately irrigate the fields, in fact, cut the fields in the name of irrigation, and if there is no adequate drainage in the soil, that could cause salinization. And this is one thing. Yet another thing is there is going to be more attack by pests and diseases. And these would call for more applications, increased applications of pesticides, fungicides, and so on, which means a lot of chemical residue, which over a period of time would increase the cancers of all kinds. 
So in other words, he was not happy. He thought that this is only a breathing space. The green revolution is not there. Our exploitative agriculture cannot be the ones to last long. It should not be allowed to last long. In fact, sooner or later, you have to change the direction and the entire mode of uh, uh, production of agriculture. So in fact, as he had also said at the time, the green revolution might also degenerate over a period of time into greed revolution. That indeed has also unfortunately happened. So the consequences are now seen. In Punjab, the best soils are gone, either salinized, a whole lot of other things have come, and now we have to, and they had been growing beet rice in rotation without uh, uh, intermittent uh, leguminous crops to sort of uh, augment the nitrogen fixation, natural nitrogen fixation by bacteria and so on. So he started working on the whole idea of how to transform this agriculture. Two other things had also come to be seen during those years in 80s. One was, one would have expected in as much as the rate of annual increment in food production because of green revolution was higher than the population rate growth. One would have expected that every Indian had, 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 had enough food to eat, but that was not the case. You saw the paradox, the paradox of mountains of grains on one hand and millions of hungry people on the other. So what went wrong? What is it? The fact of uh, the need for money, need for access to food was realized. Not only that, the lot of research and studies in our foundation, in M.S. Swamidhan's Research Foundation, of which is the Emeritus Chairman, also showed that food security at the national level is one thing, but it does not automatically percolate down to the individual household levels unless the people have money in their pocket, that is access, and also there must be clean drinking water, which is a function, uh, the absorption, so to say, that what is eaten is absorbed and assimilated into the tissues and not uh, ex uh, not lost uh, as a what you call a uh, pot belly, what you call the leak pot. So the point here is how do you go about it? Two things have become now very evident from the Green Revolution. No doubt Green Revolution, a lot of things. It changed the image of India from a begging bowl to a ba bread basket. It also saved about nearly 90 million hectares of uh, forest land from being converted into agricultural land. And just imagine what would happen if you have been converting the uh, forest land to agricultural land. The loss of biodiversity, which is con our country is known for biodiversity. We can't afford to lose them. Therefore, his mission of evergreen revolution, which is defining itself, which, is, is def which he has defined as achieving productivity in perpetuity without causing any ecological harm or social harm. Social harm is the access, that part of it. And for what do you do to, in order to overcome the social harm or the inequities? You have to ensure that there are going, there are going to be livelihoods in the rural areas. So your new uh, agricultural uh, pathway should achieve two things. One is productivity without causing uh, degradation of the soil, water, biodiversity, atmosphere, and so on, on the one hand. And on the other hand, create rural livelihoods. And in fact, he had thought of it as early as 1972 when he coined a term called techniracy. The question was, how are you going to bring technologies, suitable technologies to the rural people so that the rural women and men would be able to embark on creating livelihoods out of the resource, renewable resources, plenty of re renewable resources that are available. For example, in a, in, a, in a village which is harvesting paddy, paddy straw is a renewable resource. And what do you do with it? You can burn it as they did in Punjab and add to carbon dioxide or greenhouse gas pollution, or you can feed it to the, use it as a feed to animals, or else you can use it as a substrate to produce mushrooms. So mushrooms, when you produce, there is a value addition and there is income generation. So many different, 700, 800 such of those uh, eco-enterprises can be developed. And these eco-enterprises he had conceived uh, will have to involve training to the illiterate, largely illiterate and largely unskilled women and men in the rural villages, which he thought could be done through using a pedagogic method of learning by doing, which he called technocracy. The other thing is, yes, we need technologies. Technologies are very essential, but you have to see to it that technologies are two-edged weapons. You can make use of it, or you can you can make you you can construct or destroy with these uh, two technologies. So you wanted to make sure that these technologies that are going to be taken to villages are having three important dimensions, if not four. One is it should be pro-nature. It should not destroy, cause degradation. The second is it should have poor poor. 
it is very easy to bring uh, something like what you call the herbicide tolerant uh, uh, GM crops or herbicide roundup and finish all the uh, rural women uh, remo removing the weeds by manual and earning some money. You can do that or you can see that there is a way of uh, doing and earning. The third thing is it has to also have programmer dimension because many of the technologies are not very conducive, favorable to women. So you have to see to it that those technologies at least reduce the kind of drudgery that are there of many, many types of drudgeries on women, rural women in particular. And fourthly, yes, it is better if you can also have a pro-employment, pro-livelihood kind of things. These are the dimensions that your technology has to have. So the book that is there, which is indeed, as I told you, the brainwave of Professor Swaminathan, but I've had the privilege of being his uh, student for the second time. First time he introduced me in IRA to radiation biology. And I think I did come up to his expectation because still I'm serving on the international uh, editorial boards of prestigious international journals on radiation biology. And this book is an endeavor, whether I can do it or not. And this is exactly the ideas of his. One more thing I want to say about this is, no technology today is, uh, no uh, uh, new pathway is without also sort. That is strengths, uh, opportunities, uh, threats, and challenges. The new green, green revolution, evergreen revolution, which is defined as achieving productivity in perpetuity without accompanying social and uh, ecological harm is not also without certain uh, problems. The first and the foremost in nutshell which we have described, all these things have been described in the book, but I would like to condense it. One is the population. India is adding 19 million people annually, and we are going to surpass the population of China in maybe this decade, before the end of this decade. And our land area, if you take our ecological footprint, our ecological footprint is something vast. From our generation to my previous generation, there is a gap in the sense we feel inequities, we feel deprived. Similarly, our children and their children are going to increasingly face deprivation, inequities, not enough land to play with, not enough food, not enough anything, fruits and vegetables and prawns. So the India is today still the home to the largest number of hungry people in the world. And we are not going to be able to reach the Millennium Development Goals if the first target by 2015. Hardly there are two years. I mean, would we be able to reduce our number of hungry people who are going to bed from present uh, level of about 300 million people? No, it's not possible. If you look at the undernourished under people, malnourished children and so on, that number is almost double this number. So it is a country that needs to be on toes. This kind of what we call about the uh, glamour of uh, uh, the, the, you know, going into various other kinds of things that are beyond, you know, manufactured consumer goods and so on. Cell phones are very useful, but I think a time has come when has to be choose between Coca-Cola and drinking water in the areas and so on. But the other point is, such the population, therefore population has to be contained because denominator, numerator relationship, you cannot have the d denominator shrinking. Land is a shrinking resource today, and whereas the population consumers increasing cannot do that by any way. Uh, no matter what any population person or any politician says, this is impossible to sustain the sustainable development. The second thing is unsustainable lifestyle. You look at if every Indian and Chinese would like to emulate the lifestyle of an American, just guess what is going to happen. The poorer planet is already at crossroads. Its resources are dwindling. Its capability to, reach, re, to, to, to recycle many of these waste products and so on is shrinking. And then what is going to happen is uh, Malthus will wake up from his grave and say, aha, did I say, you only want technology to give up there, but dropped you back. And you are back to square one. So the other third problem is, you know, you have to realize that ecological foundations of agriculture are very essential. In other words, soil, good soil, good land. As Prof. Swaminathan in some of the lectures has said, you know, land is a sinking resource and fresh water diminishing, and there is a threat. Prof. Swaminathan is going to cover uh, most of the things, but one thing that I personally am very worried about is that Ganges and Jamuna and Brahmaputra may become seasonal rivers in course of next 20 years because the ice glaciers, as we see from the remote sensing, have shrunk by more than two-thirds of it. And if this should continue with no fresh snowfall and glaciers formed, what is going to happen is the remaining water will trickle down and then Ganges will be like Kaveri, Godavari, and other rivers of the world. If that happens, it is a first ecological catastrophe that will translate itself sooner or later into an agricultural disaster where famines will be revisited again. So these are the kinds of threats and these threats require a lot of changes. 
One more threat that I would like to mention is the trade. International trade, globalization is free but not fair. It is a very unfair trade. And countries like India and so on, I believe, should not have been a party to agreement and agriculture. Agriculture is not for trade, it's for livelihood and keeping the people alive. It is sustainability of survival, if I may use call the word. Now, in this case, what's going to happen is, sooner or later, you are into competition. We talk about 8% growth rate, 9% growth rates. These growth rates have not had any meaning. It does not trickle down. The people say, uh, many of the people, politicians, many of the, sir, you are an economist of distinction, uh, Professor uh, Pradhan, but I would like to say that what we need at this moment is to shift from neoclassical economics to ecological economics. The ecological economics puts ecology in the center and builds the societal and the uh, development economics around it. Whereas what we have in our planning commission and others is having, we are putting the economics at the center and go for it, and what it leaves behind is enormous load of poverty and poverty and environmental degradation form a vicious spiral. So these are some of the issues that we have discussed it. And finally, you know, in the uh, last year, there was the Rio Plus, United Nations um, Conference on Environment and Development had the Rio Plus 20. The Rio Plus 20, as far as I can say, uh, has only made many promises, and for some other many years ago wrote a, a book saying for about the Rio de from from uh, Stockholm to Rio de Janeiro, and there must be promises and not vacuum. And you know what you call, they have to do it, and not simply promises in vacuum. So the point here is question of uh, transferring from brown economy. Brown economy involves putting many chemicals and other things to a green economy. This is what we have talked about in the uh, Evergreen Revolution, that how we have to reduce the uh, chemical inputs like fertilizers, uh, pesticides, and so on. And fortunately, there are a number of good examples in this country done by our own foundation, MS Swami Northern Research Foundation, and also the Center for Sustainable Agriculture, and so on, which all give us a hope as to how agriculture can be made greener and at the same time socially equitable. So these are some of the issues that we have covered in this book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kesavan, for such an elaborate introduction to the book. Uh, I have had the privilege of introducing Professor M. S. Swaminathan on a couple of occasions to IGNU audience and outside, and every time that has been an immensely pleasurable task. I have the honor of introducing him again to this distinguished audience. Professor Swaminathan is an Indian geneticist. I repeat, he is an Indian geneticist known for Green Revolution. Actually, he is known as the father of Green Revolution in India. Professor Swaminathan was Director General of Indian Council of Agricultural Research. He was an independent chairman, food and agricultural organization. He was Director General, International Rice Research Institute. He was President of the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources and was responsible as one of the members for introducing the Convention on Biodiversity. Swaminathan is the chairman of the Swaminathan Research Foundation. Time magazine has called him one of the 20 most influential Asians of the 20th century, Max Isai Award winner. He is Darwin International Science and Environment Medal winner. Professor Swaminathan is also the recipient of the world food. This is, in fact, an endless list. And I don't want to stand between you and Professor Swaminathan. I have the privilege of inviting Professor Swaminathan to deliver that lecture. The distinguished Vice Chancellor, Professor Gopinath Pradhan, the Registrar, Sri Tolia, Professor Ravinder Kumar, Professor P.C. Keshavan, members of the faculty, ladies and gentlemen, and all those who belong to the IGNO family. I'm very grateful to the Vice Chancellor for organizing this uh, meeting uh, to commemorate uh, the UN Decade of Sustainability Science or Sustainable Development. Uh, IGNO was the probably the only one, as was mentioned earlier, uh, which tried to convert the concept of a UN decade for a, of, a, of education for sustainable development into a school here for sustainability science. I want to congratulate 
IGNO on this initiative because next year is the last year of this decade, 2014. The, that does mean that education should end in next year. But the decade ends next year, 2014, the decade of education for sustainable development. Uh, it is appropriate that uh, in, IGNO has taken it on because it was Indira Gandhi who gave a holistic idea of what is sustainable development. For a long time, sustainable development means, you know, looking at the balance sheet of companies. Is it sustainable? What is the profit and loss? It was purely in economic terms. Then it came also in environmental terms, looking at the natural resources on which development is based. But Indira Gandhi added the dimension of social sustainability in her speech at Stockholm, the UN conference on, on human development, 1972. That was the first time somebody, somebody articulated very clearly that in addition to economic and uh, environmental sustainability, social sustainability in human terms is an exceedingly important concept. So now when we talk about sustainable development, we look at the whole, holistically all these aspects of uh, sustainability. You see, you can have a wonderful uh, economics, wonderful uh, ecology, but still it may not be sustainable if the society is very inequitable and there is there are riots, there is l lack of peace and harmony and so on. So there are a number of issues which are involved. Now, uh, today, uh, I want to thank Westfield Publishing House for bringing out this book on Evergreen Revolution because when the school was started here, I thought that we must develop a number of resource material, resource books. So in the last four or five years, four to five books have been published for the benefit of the scholars may be able to give you information on many of these books. I'm going to briefly discuss the present situation on food security largely because uh, in our parliament today, there is a bill uh, which is to be introduced, It was introduced last year, to be discussed and approved on National Food Security Bill. So 2013 is a very important year in our history in terms of food security because for the first time we are to convert the right to food. It's like the right to information. It's not a patronage. It's not a political patronage. It is a legal right to food. Now, why it is important? Because in, in recent years, international prices have become very volatile. Uh, 2008, suddenly all the prices went high, sky up. And then nearly a billion more people were added to those who are hungry. Because as you know, the poorer you are, the greater is the percentage of your income which goes to food. And therefore, the prices go up, then immediately consumption goes down, and there is incre more increasing hunger. You will see from this curve, those of you who are interested, you can later on take uh, hard copies of this presentation, or it may be on, put on your website, which is there. You find it went up and down. This year, slight improve, increase in certain, like uh, wheat, maize, and so on. Maize and wheat prices have gone up largely because uh, there has been severe drought in the United States. Part of the Russian, uh, Russian Federation also experienced drought part of China and of course in India as you know you must be reading in the newspapers uh, the very severe uh, distress caused by even lack of drinking water in parts of Maharashtra uh, particularly Marathwada region I was there 10 days ago it is rather a difficult situation there will be no rain and for a long time therefore you find extreme climate events are becoming more common and uh, this is why I said the future belongs to nations with grains and not guns Guns you may be able to purchase, but grains you can't purchase. Nobody will part with grains because everybody wants for their own people. And that is why it is important to concentrate on sustainable agriculture. We had a series from our center in Chennai, to Professor Keshavan mentioned it, a series of atlases because one must know what you are dealing with, what is the background, what, what is the benchmark upon which you are developing food security. Here, these atlases, food, insecure, food insecurity in rural India, food insecurity in urban India, and the food in sustainability of food security, these three atlases have been updated also. They were originally published uh, 2002-2003. Now they have been revised and with, our, with our latest data. Hunger in these atlases is dealt with in three dimensions. 
chronic or endemic hunger, which is largely caused by lack of uh, adequate purchasing power, don't have the money to buy. Not that the food is not available in the market, but people don't have the buy. Hidden hunger is micronutrient deficiencies, iron, iodine, zinc, vitamin A, vitamin B12, small quantities. Transient hunger you find in tribal areas and so on during monsoon period when communications are disrupted. This is why in the tribal food security system, they had always believed on developing local level green banks. They keep a green bank and a seed bank as an insurance against um, food security, availability of food in the market, which is good in our country, access to food, which is a matter of purchasing power. It is, this access is the one which is being dealt with by the Food Security Act. The Food Security Act essentially does not deal with availability or absorption. Absorption of food in the body is caused by drinking water, sanitation, primary health care, and so on. All the three, all the three A's have to good, go together if you want to be a food secure person. One alone will not be enough. You can have enough, any amount of calories, but if, uh, if, if drinking water is poor. Now this, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the Great Bengal Famine of 1943, where over three million children, women, and men died out of hunger. It is our, to the credit of our country that after the Bengal famine, there has no, not been any major famine as we read in the African countries and so on. Although we have extensive chronic hunger, we are one of the uh, very high burden of malnutrition in the world is in India. But the 70th anniversary of Bengal famine, our country is now launching the Food Security Act I'm not going to deal with, because the food security bill is yet to be approved by parliament. They may undergo many changes, but there are a few interesting features we should, which you should know. It, is, it adopts a life cycle approach with special attention to the first thousand days in the child's life. That, mo that means almost a year in mother's womb and two years outside, three year old. Because this segment of the child's life was not really carefully attended to in the Integrated Child Development Service, ICDS. That is why you find still infant mortality is high, the low birth weight babies, almost every fifth baby born in our country is uh, below 2.5 kilograms in weight. The cognitive abilities are affected if you have a low birth weight and so on. The number of problems uh, are there and uh, the absorption, adoption of a life cycle approach with special attention. Life cycle means from conception to cremation. You look at all aspects of a, one's life and see you have enough nutrition during the whole life cycle. And then considering the woman as the head of the household, uh, the, the ration card or the entitlement card will be given to the senior most woman in the family thereby recognizing the critical role women play in household food security. Several of our state governments have also started their own food security bill. There's a national food security bill. Chhattisgarh, for example, is probably the first state which, uh, in the country which has a food security bill enacted by their own legislature. It has certain interesting features. It addresses concurrently the problems of calorie deprivation. In, in other words, undernutrition. Protein hunger, protein hunger caused by inadequate consumption of pulses or milk and other kinds of uh, protein rich substances and micronutrient malnutrition. Look at for example, they not only give food grains but also chena, pulses are also included in the distribution. And then for the purpose of micronutrient malnutrition, they have included salt, iodized salt, iodine uh, you can deliver through salt but now there are salts, multiple fortified salts are available. Salt which can provide not only iodine and iron, but also vitamin A. They are bioavailable, the bio, bio digestible, and therefore there's a great deal of opportunity today to attack the problem of hunger and its totality. In other words, protein calorie undernutrition, pro protein hunger itself, inadequate consumption of protein, and finally micronutrient malnutrition. Coming to the term Green Revolution, the Green Revolution term itself was coined only in 1968 by one Dr. William Gard of the United States. You'll find it in the book. Uh, but what, what does it mean? The Green Revolution is another term for improving production through productivity improvement, through yield improvement, not through area expansion. What we call vertical growth in productivity, 
not a horizontal expansion of area. This is first using the term, although the term itself was coined 1968, but for scholars, uh, you can say the Green Revolution really started in maize or corn uh, with the hybrid corn, uh, essentially in the state of Iowa in the United States, where first corn yields are, are by, as a result of exploitation of hybrid vigor went up by three to four times. If earlier corn was giving inbred varieties were giving less than one ton, the hybrid corn can give five tons, six tons, and so on. It was a quantum jump. It was not a small jump. To the, that is why it's called a revolution, not an evolution. Now, after the, after the maize, almost every crop breeder started looking for opportunities for a yield revolution, and a revolution in yield per hectare. In, 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 in wheat, it occurred in Japan uh, during World War II, uh, the Northern Experiment Station in Japan, Dr. Gonzero Inazuka uh, in 1935 identified, identified varieties of wheat which are very short, uh, dwarf varieties of wheat which you now see almost whenever you go now in Punjab, Haryana, you will only see these short varieties of wheat because they can take more nutrients and more also more uh, fertilizer. And uh, Gonzero Inazuka developed it. It went to the United States to one Orville Vogel in Washington State who gave the seed to Dr. Norman Borlaug. We ourselves got from Norman Borlaug in 1963. Again, this is the 50th anniversary of the dwarf wheat breeding program in India. 63, we started serious work uh, with material from the northern dwarfing genes uh, obtained from Mexico. And of course, those varieties from Mexico uh, had red color of seeds, very dark chapatis. So we had to, using those genes, we can easily transfer the genes, as you know, to other crops. So very quickly our scientists developed new varieties like Kalyan Sona, Sonalika, and a whole range of new material, uh, which led to what we now call. The same thing happened almost at the same time in China. If the dwarfing gene was discovered in Japan, the dwarfing gene and rice was discovered in China, in the Guangxu province of China. In fact, farmers, I think these are probably the other one, the northern dwarfing genes, I had given you the pedigree. It is, a, it is from a hybrid, it came, the cross, it came. In this case, it was a mutation which happened in the field and Chinese farmers uh, isolated them and started growing them. From mainland of China, it went to Taiwan. We got our original material, Taichung Native 1 tai, from Taiwan. Later on, the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines, they also provide a lot of material. Those of you who can see the picture, you can see uh, the root system. I want you to look at the root system of these crops. The, short, the plant is short, the plant is dwarf, but the root system is very well developed. That's very important. Why, why I'm saying is we had a dwarf variety called the Indian dwarf wheat, Triticum spherococcum, that was cultivated in the Mahanjadaro times, the Dera Ghasi Khan district of uh, Punjab, which is now in Pakistan. They used to cultivate this Indian dwarf wheat because it was very highly drought tolerant, drought tolerant, but it had a very small panicle. The plant was short, the panicle was small, and the yield was very low, although it was drought resistant. That's why it was grown. Now, to cut a long story short, you can read the book, the, both the Green to Evergreen Revolution and the present book will give you details of what all happened in the last, uh, as I said, from 1963 onwards, the 50th, 50th anniversary of the dwarf wheat breeding program in our country. There were four major components to the, we call it the Green Revolution Symphony. Anywhere, even the university will function well, only if there's a symphony approach where everybody plays their part effectively. Technology is the primer of change. Uh, technology alone will not do unless there are services like seed production, fertilizer application and so on. Public policies in terms of input-output pricing. See, there are three dimensions to this. One is the economic dimension. The economic dimension is uh, determined by public policy. The ecological dimension and the yield dimension are determined by science. But science cannot decide on economics because if you, if you, if you, if you price your grain at a very low price, then obviously the farmers won't get enough income. So you have to think of the economic dimension, which is a matter of public policy. It is only synergy between technology and public policy that will give you the necessary input. So Indian farmers achieved as much progress in wheat production in four years 
as during the preceding 4,000 years. This is the reason why it is called uh, revolution, wheat revolution. Indira Gandhi released a special stamp. This stamp has the library clock tower of the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, the POSA Institute, as it is called. Many of you have gone there, one of the, one of the very best libraries uh, anywhere in the world in, in the field of agriculture. And uh, the reason why this was put up as a symbol of science, the library of all, you know, is a knowledge storehouse of all what is happening. And therefore, it was picked up in this time as a method. Blend of scientific skill, political will, and farmer's toil. These are the three major components of the revolution. The scientific skill, political will, and farmer's toil. If you, those of you are interested in data, uh, wheat cultivation in India, as far as recorded history goes, started from the Mahanjadaro, Mahanjadaro civilization. It is now in, in Sindh, in Pakistan, the Mahanjadaro area. At, uh, from Mahanjadaro to 1947, our farmers learned to produce 6 million tons of wheat, 6 million tons. Between 63, 64 and 67, 68, from 10 to 7, 17 million tons. This is why I said 4,000 years of history were condensed in four years. This year it is 92 million tons. And uh, next month, April, when the harvest is on, probably it will be 92, 93 million tons again this year, uh, although there have been several handicaps for the farmers. Now, n nothing is an unmixed good or evil. Uh, when, the, when the yield revolution in corn was taking place in the United States, Rachel Carson found uh, enormous amount of fertilizer and pesticides were being used. And uh, she made a very interesting, uh, detailed study of what is happening as a result of the excess use of pesticide, eutrophication of lakes, uh, death of uh, uh, birds and so on. This is why it is called Silent Spring. It was a very important book at that time, 1962, when she published it. And Albert Schweitzer, who is also a Nobel Peace Prize winner, he remarked after reading the book, man has lost the capacity to foresee and to forestall. He would end by destroying the earth. This is the essence of sustainability, sustainability science. Sustainability science must do uh, proactive research, not only post-mortem research after something has happened. We must not lose the capacity to foresee and to forestall. I made an analysis of this kind uh, in 1968 in a, in a lecture in the Science Congress at Varanasi, Indian Science Congress at Varanasi. Uh, incidentally, the Science Congress uh, hosted a very important meeting uh, on sustainability science, which is published by the school. This year was the centenary of the Science Congress, where our Prime Minister was the General President. Uh, I won't go to the, uh, take your time to reading it, but you can read it. The essential analysis, what happened to biodiversity, what happens to pest resistance, and so on. Uh, the intensive cultivation of land without conservation of soil fertility and soil structure will ultimately lead to the spring of desert. The last sentence, uh, with a, uh, without first building a proper scientific and training base, uh, many may only lead to an era of agricultural disaster in the long run rather than to an era of agricultural prosperity. This is very important. This is the kind of request I will request all of you whenever you have an important scientific field application, better to make an analysis. What are the benefits? What are the risks? The risks whether it is a genetically modified crop, it is important to learn to make risk-benefit analysis. As we already mentioned by Professor Keshavan, the green to evergreen revolution uh, means increasing productivity in perpetuity without ecological harm. You can achieve it by two methods. One is organic agriculture. Organic farming is now becoming more popular in our country. But organic farming will take on. Organic farming requires more science than chemical farming. If I apply some urea, it is all right. But for organic farming, how to replenish soil fertility, how to manage the pests and so on is exceedingly important. Green agriculture means integrated pest management, integrated nutrient supply. I can provide some chemicals, but only the limited extent which is needed. So you can now develop methods by which uh, you can make green revolution into an evergreen revolution. In other words, higher productivity in perpetuity. A country like ours where land is going out of agriculture all the time, uh, it is very important that we learn how to produce more and more 
from less and less land and less and less water. Otherwise, we'll have an enormous problem. For this purpose, there is a national policy for farmers. I happen to chair a commission on uh, farmers commission, national, national commission farmers, to improve the economic viability of farming by sustainably, for sub by substantially increasing the net income of farmers, and to ensure that agricultural progress is measured by advances made in their income. See, today, uh, the Krishi Bhavan or Ministry of Agriculture usually indicate progress only by the amount of food produced. Last year was, say, 260 million tons, this year 270 million tons and so on. Even the economic survey of the Government of India gives only production figures. But ultimately what is important for the farmers is their own income. You, you must be, you know, when we pay, have six pay commission, UGC pay commission and so on, they take into account the cost of living and then try to adjust the pay. But farmers have no such commission. They have no commission. Therefore, they have to fend for themselves. And it's important to give an in income orientation. I told you earlier, the community, com local communities maintain enormous amount of genetic material, biodiversity or agro-biodiversity, agricultural biodiversity. And at the level of science, because whatever you may do, whatever farmers may do, or farm women really, who, for example, this from Kora Put, which is one of the primary centers of diversity of rice. The origin of rice in Koraput is one of the centers of diversity of rice and it's called now the globally important agricultural heritage site. They keep it in these spots, they store it, or in the field. The field conservation is called in situ on-farm conservation. In situ on-farm conservation. That is superior because this one, the National Gene Bank, National Bureau of Plant Genetic Resources, they only have cryogenic preservation. Under in a very cold temperature, uh, they keep it. Now, that's only preservation. Conservation is, means preservation and evolution that can take place only in the field and so on. The Norwegian government put up a very interesting, what you may call a Noah's Ark, the counterpart of Noah's Ark, called the, the Gene Vault, where at the moment, at the moment about six million tons, uh, six million samples of seeds of various crops are preserved. Uh, this is near the uh, North Pole. Uh, the Norwegians run it, the place called Svalbard. There's a Svalbard Treaty of which India is also a member. Our own Defense Research and Development Organization has also now set up at Changla. Any of you go to Ladakh for a holiday, you can go to Changla and see the Gene Vault, the Indian Gene Vault created by the Defense Research and Development Organization. So there are many methods of preservation of biodiversity in C2, XC2, in C2 on form, XC2 on form, and then cryogenic preservation as well as uh, in the field preservation. I told you, the, 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 as a part of the material for students in using biodiversity sustainably, uh, there's a book, we have produced a book called the Biohappiness, uh, towards bio, an era of biohappiness. Biohappiness results from the conservation, sustainable and equitable use of biodiversity, and the blending of traditional knowledge with frontier technology. Uh, what the aim of biohappiness is to convert biodiversity hotspots into happy spots, into happy spots. See, Jawaharlal Nehru used to say, we are a poor people inhabiting a rich country. The poverty of the people in relation to the contrast to the prosperity of nature always used to puzzle him. That these are the words, we are a poor people inhabiting a rich country. Now, how do you make the rich country also inhabited by rich people? That can be done, that's what I call biohappiness. That can be only done by conversion of... Uh, now, water is going to be a very important problem. I told you uh, parts of Maharashtra, parts of other parts of our country are having serious problems of water. Even where there is water, the drinking water quality is very poor, full of pesticides, full of uh, the Center for Science and Environment of uh, here under Sunita Narayan. Dr. Sunita Narayan has shown that much of the water, ground water is polluted. Some years ago they showed even the soft drinks are polluted with pesticides and so on. Now, the, at the instance of the Supreme Court of India, the Department of Science and Technology has started a program called War for Water. This is not war is fighting, of course there are fights in our country, but this war is winning, augmentation and renovation. It involves rainwater harvesting, recycling of wastewater, conjunctive use of water, desalination, 
and safe drinking water and so on. Chirapunji, uh, called, now called Soha, uh, Sora uh, in Meghalaya, it is, so it, it is credited with the having the heaviest rainfall in the world, 14,000 millimeters and so on. Chirapunji already in your, now it's called Sora. Uh, but if you go there now, you'll have difficulty in getting water. This is why under the Jalkun program, under the war for water, a number of small ponds, people have been now, uh, in, uh, people have been encouraged to store water uh, in small ponds and use it very sustainably. Our own, the large program called Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Program, if you read its objectives, the watershed management, aquifer recharge, water harvesting, water storage, these are all important, important uh, components of the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Program. Uh, unfortunately, this program, uh, by the, the act itself says it has to be unskilled work, unskilled work. But Mahatma Gandhi always said labor must be uh, combined with intellect. Intellect and labor or uh, brain and brawn, unless they are combined, the labor alone won't give you enough uh, return. This is what we have to do. I have been recommending to the government that they must establish uh, for the best Nariga team, which has done a very good job in watershed management, water conservation, an ecological security savior award. We got a similar award for tribal women called a Genome Savior Award, women and men. Those who have saved, for example, the Koraput women and men have got a Genome Savior Award. Many other tribal families and indigenous families have got. Now, as far as the climate change is concerned, every year there's a conference. The last one was Doha. Uh, before that was Cancun, Durban, and uh, Copenhagen, and so on. Because the conference of parties to the Global Convention on Climate Change, they meet every year uh, and then discuss. Unfortunately, the progress has been very poor. It is clear that climate change requires tough action to reduce emissions. Basically, the imbalance between emissions, or greenhouse gas emissions, and absorption, uh, that's what causes the problem, of which carbon is very important. How do you develop a low carbon pathway of development? The challenge here is, Energy is a key requirement. For everything, energy is a key requirement. At the same time, how do you have a green energy, clean energy in our own country? The Prime Minister uh, mission, there are eight missions for the mitigation of climate change. One of them are solar, solar mission, uh, where they have a large program, and uh, there is a water mission and so on. Uh, similarly, the future roadmap, the industrialized world has to cut emissions by 40% below 1990 levels by 2020. The United States, which is not the Kyoto Party, the Kyoto Protocol uh, is the one which determines what every country should do. They call it common but differentiated responsibility. There are co certain common responsibilities. There are also differentiated responsibilities depending upon your own economic status, where you have developed. For example, the US should really uh, agree to take on a comparable commitment. There have been a Green Climate Fund, many other initiatives which have been done. Mitigation, what can you do for mitigation, apart from adaptation? Adaptation and mitigation are both important. In the case of mitigation, for example, uh, deforestation is a very important reason why the carbon imbalance comes. Reducing deforestation and forest degradation and promoting a forestation is called RED. Uh, cows and buffaloes are usually blamed for methane emissions, methane emissions, the dung and so on. The way to do this is biogas plant. Your biogas plant gives you energy, at the same time manure. Uh, also ammonia volatilization through fertilizer, the ammonia, ammonia volatilization, that can be controlled by simple methods by coating the urea with neem and putting it under the ground. For example, the prilled urea. I've been suggesting to our uh, Pachim Bangla uh, people, uh, the efficiency of use, fertilizer is very very highly subsidized. In spite of the subsidy, uh, the efficiency of use is very poor. Uh, but you can improve the efficiency by over 40% by means of simple techniques like putting the urea 7 to 10 centimeters depth in reduced zone. And there are simple implements which are now available to do this. One consequence of uh, higher temperature because there are three or four consequences of climate change of importance for food security. One is increasing temperature, mean temperature, 
which is already taking place slowly. There are controversies, but uh, there are reports. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says that there is an increase. There is also precipitation changes, either too much precipitation leading to floods or no precipitation at all leading to drought and sea level rise. We have a very long coastline and also the Andaman, Nicobar Islands and Lakshadweep group of islands. Take for example potato. Potato, uh, although it's a Latin American plant, we are the largest cultivator of potato. Nearly 40 million tons of potatoes we produce. Now what will happen is, this is because we produce the seed potato in the plains of North India during the aphid free season. The season where there is no vector, the vector for virus diseases. But that advantage will go away if the temperature goes up. Same with malaria also. Malaria, many of these vector bone diseases, both human beings, animals and plants will have problems. Now the only way of uh, saving our potato crop is through true potato seed. Uh, those of you know it looks like brinjal uh, solanaceae seeds, after all it's salt of solanaceae. Similarly, rust diseases. So far we have not had what is called stem rust, largely confined to peninsular India. But once the temperature goes up, uh, the stem rust will become very important. In other words, we have to start genetic checkmating. You see, it's like a good army general. The general's duty is to checkmate the enemy. Similarly, scientific checkmating of the spread of pathogens is very important. You will have to do it. For example, this was the work we did in the 1960s uh, before the green revolution because we want to ensure that if the farmer is going to buy fertilizer and put some more water and get higher yield, it should be sustainable. And that means we must control the diseases and pests. So we had a gene deployment strategy, a gene deployment strategy, which this is the race of the pest, this is the gene which can give resistance, so that you have a genetic checkmating. Uh, now, you, you can put along with the, with the absorption of carbon uh, through and f photosynthesis, we can build a lot of carbon in soil. Our soil organic matter has gone down, soil carbon content has gone down. This is one of the reasons why our fertilizer efficiency is poor. Uh, one can now put the impact of sea level rise, I told you the importance to India, inundation of low-lying coastal lands with sea water, millions of hectares of land would be affected, and small islands like our Lakshadweep and so on, uh, and also Maldives. Maldives is very much threatened, which will go down. Also Sundarbans, the Sundarbans, both the Bangladesh side of Sundarbans and our side of Sundarbans, they are all endangered seawater intrusion into freshwater aqua. Now, this is why nature, Gandhiji used to say, nature provides for everyone's need, but not for everybody's greed. This is true. You find in nature a whole set of plants, uh, xerophytes, uh, halophytes, and so on. Halophytes are salt-tolerant material. Uh, mangrove is a very good one. Uh, so we, now we are spreading the concept of mangrove bioshield. In Tamil Nadu, in Andhra, they found during the tsunami of 2004, uh, December 26, immediately after Christmas, they found wherever there were very good mangrove plantation, uh, the, the damage was less because it acts like a speed breaker. This is what we call bio shield. Now, but these mangroves, you know, Mahatma Gandhi started the Salt Satyagraha in 1930 at uh, Dandi March, which was a turning point. We have got a very beautiful uh, on the way Sardar Patel Road, the Dandi March. And that was a very important turning point in our struggle for freedom. But what was Mahatma Gandhi's, uh, uh, he was ahead of his time in many cases. He said 97% of the world's water is sea water. It has to be a social resource. It cannot be privatized. It cannot, government cannot uh, tax the tax sea water for making it. This concept is wider. Uh, it was Sal Satyagraha. Uh, at the same time, Rajaji, Rajakopalachari, and uh, though his colleagues started the same salt satyagraha at a place called Vedaranyam, Vedaranyam in Tamil Nadu coast. We are now establishing a genetic garden of halophytes at Vedaranyam. A genetic garden of halophytes means all salt tolerant plants which are going to be increasingly important in the future but which are all vanishing. The, the genetic erosion is very high and so we are collecting them. Uh, it is, it is, uh, we estimate about 1,300 plants are to be collected. And what are we doing with 97% of the water? Uh, I said sea water constitutes 97%. The fresh water out of 3%, 1.5% are, are, in, are in big ice, Arctic ice and so on. 
So we have started a program called seawater farming for coastal area prosperity. Uh, in, uh, in other words, you pro mangrove or other atriplex and so on, and then cultivation of fishes in between. For example, Salicornia biglovi, very high saline tolerant, uh, and edible oil 28%, protein is 31%, for animals particularly, is very important. This year happens to be uh, the 60th anniversary of the discovery of the double helix structure of the DNA molecule by Watson and Crick along with uh, uh, two others, uh, Rosalind Wilson. She unfortunately died before the Nobel Prize was given. She is the one who prepared all the X-ray diffraction uh, pictures at Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. But that, at that time, I was, I was, a, uh, I was at the same time as Watson Crick in Cambridge. I never realized the, this discovery. They published a simple paper in, in, the, in the science journal Nature. I never thought it was going to have such an earth-shaking earth -shaking impact, but it has led to enormous impact, molecular genetics or new genetics as we call them. Uh, every field, medicine, agriculture, animal husbandry, vaccine production, genetic modification. For example, uh, in my own laboratory, uh, young scholars uh, led by one Dr. Ajay Parida, uh, they have transferred genes from mangroves to rice for salt, salt, salt water tolerance. Because when the sea level goes up, we will require more plants with salt water tolerance. The only gene technology which is under cultivation in our country is the Bt cotton, uh, which is a very controversial one, the Bt cotton in India. But the fact remains, when the Bt cotton was introduced, from that time onwards, the area has gone up, the total production has gone up, although the first generation of Bolgard cottons have broken down. A very hot topic in many laboratories uh, in the world today is to how to convert what we call a C4, C3 plant, which is rice, a C3 pathway of photosynthesis to C4 re-engineering photosynthesis to develop physiologically efficient rice. C4 rice could increase rice yield by 25 to 50%, double water use efficiency, improve nitrogen use efficiency, and so on. So these are possible today because we can move genes across sexual barriers before this was not possible, before the recombinant DNA technology. But many things can also be achieved by marker-assisted selection, not necessary. Some advantages of C4 photosynthetic system, faster and more complete translocation of assimilates from leaf, photo, I won't bother you with the technical detail, photorespiration. Now, there is always the problem of assessing risks and benefits, whether it is nuclear power, whether it is biotechnology product or nanotechnology product. The question public have to be assured that the benefits far outweigh any risk. The risk and benefit analysis by a regulator, a regulatory agency. And unfortunately, we don't have a regulatory agency for biotechnology, which, uh, which inspires public confidence political confidence, media confidence, professional confidence. Therefore, a committee, uh, Professor Keshavan is a committee, is in a committee of the Supreme Court, but I have taken the quotation from the committee of Parliament, Committee on Agriculture, headed by one, Vasudeva Acharya, and he, they have recommended a national biosafety authority by an act of Parliament to assess risks and benefits from GMOs with reference to biodiversity, human animal health, and environment a national biosafety authority is needed. They have advised that we must develop legislation using the Norwegian model. Norway has an excellent piece of legislation they have suggested. Now, let me, the last part of my talk, in spite of all our progress, scientific progress, our position in human development, in, uh, in nutrition, malnutrition figures is very, very bad. Uh, Prime Minister called it a national shame. National Family Health Survey says malnourished children under five are above 40% of children are malnourished. Low birth weight children are 21%. Uh, Union Planning Commission says for the next plan, a minimum of 270 million are undernourished. Of course, the calculation of the new Food Security Act tries to cover nearly 80% of the population. UNDP Human Development Report, which was released last week, a few days ago, uh, puts us 136 position among 187 countries. Very unfortunate. We are not our position, in spite of all our infrastructure, universities, and uh, various facilities. Enormous amount, amount of money being spent on social protection. We find our status in Human Development Report 
is almost remaining the same. Uh, UNDP has also a gender inequality index, which is now being discussed in great detail, the whole gender equity, gender justice, and gender uh, safety. Uh, UNDP gender inequality uh, index places us at 132 position out of 148 countries. Huh? That means, again, very, very low, very low in terms of gender inequality. The nutrition barometer plays also very big. But on the other hand, the number of plants, naturally occurring plants, uh, which are very rich in iron, rich in calcium, potassium, moringa, moringa, the drumstick, the drumstick leaves are very rich in a wide range of micronutrients. There is also now what is called biofortification. The varieties of bajra, which are very rich in iron. So in other words, nature again provides material which is very rich in various fisheries which had undergone a little, the small scale fisheries, artisanal fisheries. Uh, this man lost his wife during the tsunami. Therefore, he was very afraid to go to the sea. Now he goes, because he has got a small boat, before going and getting into the boat, he, he checks up what will be the wave height at different distances of the ocean. This, this information is provided by INCOIS, the Indian National Service of the Ministry of Earth Sciences at Hyderabad. INCOIS provides data on wave heights and also where the fish shoal are. So modern information technology, we call it a transformational technology. I think our Professor Avinath asked all of you to switch off your mobile. Everybody has got one or two mobiles now. It has completely changed the way in which we communicate. You can't believe that the 10 years ago, 15 years ago, today anybody, there is nobody without a, there are about 800 million mobile phones in this country. In other words, these are transformational technology. Let us just add the dwarfing gene was a transformational gene. We need more and more such transformational technology. Uh, that is rural women and men, usually 8th class, who are past 8th class or 10th class, but who have mastered the digital technology. Dr. Abdul Kalam, our former president, was very fond of this academy. In fact, uh, this is a picture of the academician. Uh, many people write to us, can you elect us to the academy? We say this is not an academy for PhD holders. These are for rural people, rural women and men who are working in knowledge. In fact, Dr. Kalam asked me when he came for the first convocation, Will you invite me for the second convocation? I said, normally the same person doesn't come. But he said, no, make an exception. And he did come for the second convocation. Just to show, he called it a celebration of India's rural core competence. He said the academy represents one, in fact, one of the convocations we had in this very hall, very hall, where not only from India, but also from Afghanistan and other countries were also indebted. There is a Harvest Plus biofortification which adds iron, zinc, pro-vitamin A, and so on. Uh, next year is the year, next year, the end of the year, decade uh, for sustain, sustainability, uh, sustainable development education. But next year is declared as the international year of family farming. One of the things which we want to do during next year is to s promote the concept of every farm, every family farm. Why, is they, why are they celebrating family farming? because more and more corporate farming is taking over. Large companies, highly mechanized, but we must preserve because family farming is not only farming, it is a culture, it's a culture. The culinary diversity, cultural diversity characterized in the rural India, the folk songs, the folk songs and poetry and so on. So next year will be the year of family farming. We are, we are launching a program called Every Family Farm into an eco come nutri farm by mainstreaming the principles of ecology, that is sustainable development, and nutrition farming system. Lastly, in the latest budget, after all I said earlier, unless you have public policy support, which must be reflected in, uh, in allocation of resources. Without resources, you can't do anything. Uh, Ms. Chidambaram uh, budget this year, 2013-14, has three different components uh, in the field of uh, evergreen revolution. One is defend the gains already made. The Punjab Haryana region is the heartland of the Green Revolution, Punjab Haryana, Western region. But that is in deep ecological distress uh, because the water table is going down, soil is getting salinized and so on. So the program there is more crop diversification, a legume being introduced, not only wheat rice, wheat rice, wheat rice, but wheat legume pulses and so on. Extend again to new areas. This is for Eastern India, starting from Assam, 
Bihar, Orissa, uh, and also Chhattisgarh, and Eastern UP, uh, many of these areas, uh, we call it the sleeping giant of Indian agriculture. The sleeping giant that has to be awakened. Finally, make new gains. New gains, which Chidambaram has provided to piece 200 crore, to start on a pilot scale, a major initiative for marrying nutrition and agriculture. Time has come for us to marry nutrition and agriculture by establishing new tree farms. Nearly 60% of the consumers are also farmers. The widespread malnutrition prevailing in our country can be overcome only if farm families are also enabled to have balanced diet. The new program proposed by Shri Chodhambaram for organizing new tree farms will involve introducing in the cropping system biofortified crops which are rich in iron, zinc, vitamin A, vitamin B12 and other micronutrients as well as those which are rich in protein like quality protein maize. The program will be taken up in the districts which are suffering from high, there are 200 districts which are high malnutrition burden. So ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, uh, India with a, with a very large population, uh, it is now population uh, stabilization measures are yielding fruit, uh, but nevertheless we believe a minimum 150 crore of people, 1.5 billion uh, by 2030. Land is going out of agriculture, water is getting scarce, there is pollution, and also there is need for more jobs. It's only agriculture which provides job-led growth. Modern industry is a jobless growth. What are with the population, with most of the population being young, 40% of the population being below the age of 30, they require jobs, they require uh, scope. That can be provided only in rural India, and that is why we should ensure that the best in modern technology is combined with the best in traditional wisdom, what we call eco-technologies. That is the very purpose of sustainable development. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you. Thank Professor Swaminathan to belittle the enormity of the power of his words. I will not do that. I will request Vice Chancellor to give him the university memento. For the vote of thanks. <laughs> so. It's uh, really my proud privilege to propose a vote of thanks to all the dignitaries sitting on the dais on this special occasion. As uh, all of you know, IGNU, through its association with distinguished scientists and academics, has been in the forefront of providing a forum for bringing knowledge, technologies, skill, innovation to the benefit of, common, benefit of the common man. This function is to mark, the, the function to mark the release of the book, Evergreen Revolution in Agriculture, Pathway to a Green Economy, by, uh, co-authored by Professor Swaminathan and uh, Professor P.C. Keshwan, is one of many faceted approaches by IGNU to address growing need for an environmentally sustainable agriculture. I, on behalf of IGNU, take this opportunity to thank immensely our beloved Professor Saminathan and uh, Professor Keshwan, uh, uh, whose book has been released today by our Honorable Vice-Chancellor, Professor Gopinath Prasad. I thank Professor Gopinath Pradhan 
Honorable Vice Chancellor Ignu for his constant and uh, proactive support he has given making this function a grand success. It has been a challenge to provide affordable quality food to everybody in adequate quantities in these times, especially in the face of reducing land resources. I thank the father of Green Revolution in India, Professor M. S. Swaminathan, for enlightening through his lecture on food security in an era of climate change and providing valuable inputs for our IGNU fraternity, which will enable them to increase their understanding and augment their research and academic capabilities. Translating scientific knowledge to the benefit of the common man and to his daily life has been a challenge all along, especially in this age, monetizing everybody, ev everything including knowledge. The significance of the book released today can only be understood in this context. I, on behalf of IGNU and its fraternity, offer sincere gratitude to Professor P.C. Keswan, the author, uh, the co-author, for being present here and sharing his wisdom through the book and his thought on this occasion. I am thankful to Professor K. M. K. Saluja, Director of School of Agriculture, and his team members, Dr. Venkat Raman and others, for being instrumental in organizing this public lecture. I also thank Professor Ravinder Kumar, Director of School of Tourism and the anchor, uh, and Director EMPC, Director of Horticulture, and the entire EMPC's team uh, for providing required technical support and rendering the video recording. I am also thankful to uh, Dr. Yadav, Chairman Horticulture Cell, and the staff for a pleasant dice. Most importantly, I thank all the faculty, the staff, special invitees, guests, who have been kind enough to join us at, the le at this lecture and book release function and have graced us with their presence. Thank you very much.